Australia. Someone like Janet Coombs made it a feature of her career to assist uh, newcomers. She was constantly wanting to increase the number of women at the bar and she made an offer which I was so grateful to accept in the end that I could start my practice by sharing her chambers. But at the same time there was another group of women who were here who were, who were practicing and they were, um, they were of the age of my mother and they would say things like I hope you're not going to desert us the way your mother did and get married and go and have a family. Beatrice ignored this advice and did have a family. It was harder to obtain chambers once she moved out from the room she shared with Janet Coombs. I can remember one particular leader of the floor who is a senior uh, QC who's still around and very well regarded. He, and he's going to remain nameless, When I went to see him, he said, Beatrice, I have no objection to you at all. I think you may have a wonderful practice. I think you'll have a wonderful career. But the problem is the floor really doesn't want women. If we allow one of you on, you will insist on others coming. And we we really don't want you. You just exchange work between each other and your little club and you exclude us and we don't see that that's to our commercial advantage. What about there being a club? (laughs) Well, you wouldn't answer that to him, but the reality was they were... Well, they were and they weren't. Not all of them were. The reality is, in this day and age, that silk would never speak like that. But he, life was so free for him to speak like that, that that was acceptable and he thought it was fair. And that is how they spoke to you. I had won the prize in family law when I was going through, but it, I knew I didn't want to continue to do family law. And uh, I felt that women were being slotted into family law all the time. The work that I really wanted and would love to have got, and I found that women couldn't get, it was government work, intellectually stimulating government work. And the men at the bar who had the right contacts could get it, but I found I couldn't get it. Mary Gordron, later to be the first woman judge on Australia's High Court, was admitted in 1968 after being the first part-time student to win the Sydney University Medal for Law. Absolutely serious about going to the bar from the age of eight. Absolutely serious. I won't pretend I had all the money, but I had a sufficient amount of money and a husband who was prepared to guarantee me at the bank if I needed any more. I mean, I was doing it as a very sensible business proposition. I was shocked and outraged when I got there to find that that, um, the place was closed, absolutely closed. You you were the first woman on the Bar Council of New South Wales. Were those sorts of matters fresh in your mind during your time on the Bar Council? Oh, yes, very much so. But but let me say that that there were some men who, who were aware of the problem particularly Frank Hatley, also Trevor Martin, both of whom had been my lecturers and so on. And they were certainly aware that there were, there were real issues and I think those two proposed me for the Bar Council. And and also, of course, it wasn't, wasn't just the women's issue at that stage. It really was the closed, almost defensive nature of the Bar. It was very inward-looking. It was very much about preserving things as they were. Mary Gordon was regarded as a fine advocate, earning the nickname Mary the Merciless. She had an extensive practice at the bar with a special interest in industrial law and defamation, though she also undertook a number of civil rights cases. In 1972, Mary Gordon appeared for the Whitlam Labor government in the Equal Pay case, which she successfully argued before the Arbitration and Conciliation Commission. There were two major equal pay cases, the 1969 Equal Pay case and the 1972 Equal Pay case. The 1972 Equal Pay case granted to women equal pay for work of equal value. However, some employers sought to avoid the application of the rulings by reclassifying or renaming women's jobs.
1974, Mary Gordon was appointed Deputy President of the Australian Conciliation and Arbitration Commission, from which she resigned in 1980. Mary was also Chairman of the Legal Services Commission from 1979 to 1980, and she lectured in Industrial Law and Defamation at the University of New South Wales in 1980. The role didn't have a wonderfully high profile. I know that the Attorney General had approached other people who had turned the position down and turned it down or, and or wanted other conditions. All jobs, you, 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 can, you can make off them what you want. There were a lot of constitutional cases in the pipeline and coming along, a lot of it being what I would call the bread and butter of constitutional law, the Section 109 cases, for example. Similarly, you, you were having uh, issues in between the uh, federal and state industrial regulations. So there was a lot of constitutional work bubbling along, and, of course, the native title cases were bubbling along at that stage too. So it was a very interesting time. And if you'd like to move into the constitutional area, it was wonderful. I rather think the bar wasn't smart enough to see what was happening or what was going to happen, so I don't think they were greatly fussed, as they might otherwise have been, you know, when their golden boys had turned it down. They thought that the constitutional, all the good work, it would still be briefed out. Well, of course, it wasn't. <laughs> that was, I mean... <laughs> that was there for the picking and mm-hmm. there you go. So I think after a while I got a bit a bit concerned that, that the work was staying with me rather than going back to them. But anyway, that's Saint Levy. 